I'm Alan Murray, President of the College. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you uh, to the 2012 Genevieve Stout Guestship Lecture, uh, which we've been offering since 2002 annually. Let me offer you uh, a word of context for understanding Genevieve Stout, more than just a name. Her context is this. Uh, as you may know, Elmhurst College was a, a male-only uh, pro seminary uh, for a good part of its uh, first uh, 40, 50 years or so. And then in uh, 1930, women were admitted for the first time. 46 women came in and brought their enrollment to an all-time high of 233. The, uh, the administration first thought that uh, women would want to study the secretarial sciences, and they were wrong. No one enrolled in secretarial sciences, and it was promptly dropped the next year. Uh, women were actually the uh, first large group of commuter students since uh, housing was not yet available for women on the campus. And since they could not be ordained evangelical ministers, they were liberal arts rather than pre-theology majors. Uh, many of the women, in fact, were not members of the evangelical church. So for the first time in the college's history, sizable numbers of students from other faiths were enrolling at the college. Uh, thus, women uh, brought the first interfaith component to Elmhurst College. It's against that context that I offer you Genevieve Stout. Uh, Genevieve Stout arrived while Timothy Lehman was president. And here I quote from uh, Melinda Cutright's great biography, The College. In 1932, Genevieve Stout, a professor in the education department, was appointed dean of women, a position she held until 1961. Consider that, from 32 to 61. Her job included everything, from counseling students to inspecting rooming houses to establishing the social calendar and chaperoning all events that women attended, including the dances that had begun on campus in 1930. When women were allowed to live in part of Erion Hall in 1933, Stout moved in with her charges. With housing on campus finally available, the number of women increased. According to Dean Stout, 44% of the early women were working their way through college, yet the grades were substantially higher than the men's. The women's record of accomplishment, she writes, eased some of the objections of alumni who would wish to keep Elmhurst all male. Uh, to summarize, uh, Genevieve Stout served as Dean of Women from 32 to 61 and Dean of Students from 48 to 61. This was a 30-year career of service to the first women of Elmhurst College and their successors. Our current Stout guestship honors Genevieve Stout and her path-breaking contributions to the college and its students, especially its women students, throughout the Great Depression, the Second World War, and the post-war period that laid the groundwork for the profound social changes of the 1960s and beyond. Clearly, she lived in very, very exciting times. And this annual guestship lecture commemorates her service and legacy. So welcome, and at this time, I'm pleased to offer uh, Rachel Mentor of the Gender Equality Group. Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel, and I'm the president of the Elmhurst College Gender Equality and Rights Organization, or as we like to call it, GEAR. Uh, we meet every Tuesday at 6 p.m. And we focus on raising awareness and preventing gender inequality. We have participated in DuPage County's Take Back the Night, held annual Equal Payday Bake Sales, uh, covered the campus with Operation Beautiful on National Love Your Body Day, and raised awareness for the prevention of domestic violence and the prevention of breast cancer. Kira is truly proud that Elmhurst College continues the stout guestship, and we're happy to learn from the wonderful women come each year. And now I introduce the political science professor, Mary Walsh. articulated a perception that had been plaguing feminism for over 10 years and which continues to confront feminists in what is alleged to be a post-feminist age. Despite some answers to the contrary, feminism is alive, if not well. In some regards, feminism is a victim of its own success, well, at least in the West. <laughs> 
but much work remains to be done in the United, in the United States and across the globe. Discussions about the future of feminism are essential in any community concerned about oppression, especially the oppression of women. We are honored to have with us today Emily Swafford, who will help us to think about the future of feminism. Ms. Swafford is a PhD candidate on 20th century U.S. history at the University of Chicago and a recipient of the General and Mrs. Matthew B. Ridgway Military History Research Grant from the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center. She is currently completing her dissertation entitled Democracy's Proving Ground, American Military Families in Germany Between World War II and Vietnam. She received her BA from the University of Virginia in History and American Studies. Her current research interests include the history of women and gender, particularly in the ways that they intersect with military history and foreign affairs. Swafford's expertise and perspective on family, women, and gender promise to add to our ongoing local, national, and international discussion on the future of feminism. And so it is with great excitement and anticipation that I introduce Emily Swafford. Forgive me, I have to sort of orient myself here. Oh, okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for those for those wonderful introductions. Um, good afternoon. It is an honor to be invited here today for the annual Genevieve Stout Guestship Lecture. And it is a pleasure to get to spend the next hour or so, hopefully less, uh, talking to you about something that I believe is both interesting and important. And that is the role of women and gender in history. I wish to thank Elmhurst College and Peggy Stenko for, uh, Elmhurst College for inviting me and Peggy Stenko for organizing the logistics. And I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Russ Ford for, for providing information on Dean Stout College. You guys already have some um, from the introduction. Today, I would like to do three things. First, I'd like to lay out uh, a common ground by briefly giving an overview of Christine Stanzel's The Feminist Promise, which I understand that some of you have read for the corresponding Stout seminar. Uh, and I hope that this will lay out a starting point for today's discussion. Secondly, I would like to illustrate the importance of The Feminist Promise by relating it to some of my own work, which deals with, as you just heard, American military families in Germany after World War II. And finally, I'd like to end with a story of Dean Stout and some thoughts about how keeping the feminist promise today entails understanding the role of women and gender in the past. And one final note, my intention today is not to shut down discussion, but to open it up. I hope that you will view this talk as a starting point of a conversation, or perhaps as an addition to an ongoing one. And so I welcome your comments and questions at the end. Christine Stanzel's uh, latest work is a sweeping uh, history of feminism, beginning with Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Women, and ending with present, present, present day feminists and their ambiguous feelings towards the US invasion of Afghanistan, which was justified in part by fighting to free women from the Taliban's brutal rule. At its most basic level, Stansel argues that feminism is democracy's younger sister, born with the revolutions based on the natural rights of man in the late 18th century, and growing up through later struggles over liberal democracy, including abolitionism and the 14th Amendment, women's suffrage, and civil rights movement. Stanzel's evidence is largely drawn from US and European sources, but that is part of the point, that the evolution of feminism is, a, is the product of specific historical circumstances, not a manifestation of universal truth or longing. Using the lens of feminism that Stanzel has created unlocks or highlights aspects of liberal democracy that have perhaps been forgotten in its gradual ascendance. Just like feminism, liberal democracy itself was not received truth, but something fought over and for. That the rights of man were so often and so easily denied to women has been at the heart of feminism's long crusade, a fight which Stanzel argues is not yet won. And understanding that is part of what she calls democracy's patience work. Stansel posits four main themes that run through the history of feminism. 
The first is the relationship between what she calls the politics of the mothers and the politics of the daughters. The politics of the mothers is above all pragmatic, seeking to improve the position of women without a fundamental change in the status quo. The daughters, on the other hand, have contempt for the status quo, connecting women's rights to dramatic structural transformations, often accompanied by the optimistic and sometimes naive belief that a new world is possible. Yet, says Stansel, the most sweeping changes, achievement of suffrage, Roe v. Wade, have been accomplished only when the mothers and the daughters work together. The second theme, theme Stansel follows is the way vestiges of family government have persisted throughout the evolution of democratic government. American law books inherited coverture from English common law. This is the idea that women are covered by their husbands and fathers, that these male figures speak for the women under their control and protection. Even as democracy has seemed to grant greater and greater independence to its individual adherents, remnants of this paternalism span the centuries, linking, as Stancil puts it, married women's inability to buy and sell property to the notorious difficulties women encounter in prosecuting domestic violence and marital rape. The third theme that runs through the history of feminism, says Stancil, is the idea of universal woman. The idea that she, who is so different from myself, is really like me in fundamental ways, because we are both women. It is, of course, as she says, a political fiction on par with we the people or workers of the world. A fiction that more often than not reveals schisms and inequalities rather than unity among women and feminists. But even as a fiction, she maintains that it has been useful and sometimes splendid, often remaining at the heart of feminist space of power. And finally, the last theme Stansel uh, charts is how feminism is, has played across the political spectrum, left and right. Feminists working for women's rights have sometimes supported other political evils, such as colonialism and slavery. And if we are to do feminism justice as an intellectual tradition that plays out over historical time and space, we must be attuned to its multiplicities. Stansel argues, and here's a, a, a quote from her, it's a long quote, but I think it sums up. At different times, Feminism has promised to bring about world peace, end prostitution, and abolish pornography, the sexual double standard, the nuclear, and the nuclear family. Feminists have promised to make women more like men, to teach men to be more like women, and to make sexual difference irrelevant altogether. They have sought a world where there is less sex, more sex, better sex, and better marriages, no marriage, and gay marriages. In other words, feminism has encompassed a wide variety of social views and positions sometimes antagonistic to one another. So feminism is an intellectual tradition, an argument, neither a fixed point of view nor a perceived truth. Stanzel illustrates these four themes, the mothers and the daughters, the vestiges of the family government, the universal woman, and this political spectrum, with many familiar landmarks and faces. There is Wolfgang Kraft, who works in Abigail Adams, ultimately and effectively to remove the ladies. There is the relationship between women's rights and abolitionism, the dramatic meeting at Seneca Falls, and the disappointment felt when Congress declined to specifically include women in the 14th Amendment. There are the Grimke sisters, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, Amelia Bloomer. There are the wild suffragettes of the 19-teens, Alice Paul and those who joined her, who dared to picket the White House and go to prison, but also the steady plotting of the National American Women's Suffrage System. As the 20th century moved forward, there's also Simone de Beauvoir and Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, birth control, and Roe v. Wade, followed by Phyllis Schlafly, who advocated for what she saw as the betterment of women by arguing against feminism. At the end of Stancil's story, there are the newest standard bearers of feminism, NGOs that work for women's reproductive health worldwide, that advocate for prosecuting rape as a war crime, and those who insist that women's rights but there are also new faces and previously overlooked stories. Global feminism is perhaps something new in the narrative of feminism, but Stansel shows that it has ever been transatlantic, and actually here I'm going to show you more pictures, uh, that it has ever been transatlantic, and that it traveled with democracy's missionaries as they spread imperial fingers and staked out colonial footholds. Similarly, Stansel chronicles the turn of the century's disheartening partnership between feminism and Jim Crow, a low point that seems out of place in what we'd like to believe feminism stands for. But she also resurrects triumphs and successes that have been overlooked. She points out African-American suffragists who, under Jim Crow oppression, often lived more companionate marriages than their white counterparts and folded feminism into their work for racial uplift. 
Stansel also delved into feminism's lost years in the 1950s and the early Cold War to show how the slow gathering of information and the infiltration of legislative politics beginning in the 1950s was able to achieve expanded protection for women from sex discrimination in the workplace and the passage of Title IX, even as the Equal Rights Amendment was never ratified. These are often the less, less dramatic stories of feminism, patient and full of compromise. They lack the flash of thinking the White House or the sexiness of free love. But Stansel convincingly shows how these seemingly slower periods and temporary retreats are fundamental to understanding feminism as an argument that faints and parries as often as it strikes the blow. There are a few things that I found especially helpful. For one, for one, historians love to make the argument, and perhaps scholars everywhere, but specifically historians, that two things that are seemingly unrelated are actually part of the same thing. You know, you know that game where you play one of these things that's not like the other? This is actually a game of which of these things belong to you. And for this reason, I was drawn to Stansel's final chapter in the story of feminism, where she charts NGOs. This is history that, for the most part, overlaps with my own historical experience, but where feminism is alive and well, not over and done with. And it helps to show how things that seem new and progressive actually have a long history. For example, many of these NGOs were responsible for the revelation that increasing women's access to, uh, to, to income raises the standard of living for the whole household. And this led to a burst of activity on the international, on the international scene uh, in, in creating microbanks worldwide. But this insight was first discovered by British social workers in the First World War, and then promptly forgotten. It was resurrected for a new life only by those who took women seriously as political and economic actors. The other thing that I found particularly memorable are the deft personality sketches that are found throughout the narrative. I love that these women, on the left and on the right, are whole women. That, that while this is in many ways an intellectual history, it is a history of people and their ideas. For example, Mary Wollstonecraft is in many ways the progenitor of feminism, and her writings are duly examined in Stanley's book. But she also takes care to show how Wollstonecraft is a person and a, to show Wollstonecraft as a person and a feminist, grappling with how to reconcile personal fulfillment and political ideals. Not every woman, perhaps, has Wollstonecraft's proclivity to wild wishes, but it does well to remember the importance of women's experience in history. So these stories, both by the NGOs and Wollstonecraft, the end and the beginning of Stanza's story, also highlight something else that I think is important. There is a chronic problem within feminism and democracy as a whole. It's easy forgetfulness of what has come before. This is amplified by the seeming generational differences between the politics of the mothers and the politics of the daughters, with each generation discovering anew the long history of the oppression of women. But if historical actors can't remember what came before, the historian can. And the patient work of the historian is in, is in evidence when, for example, Stansel narrates the President's Commission on the Status of Women under President Kennedy. She describes Polly Murray compiling evidence of rampant sex discrimination in the early 1960s and digging into the varied history of women in the law. Behind her, Stansel imagines another image of women, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who first poured through her father's law books and related the dismaying results to the Seneca Falls Convention in 1948. As a corollary to arguing that feminism is part of the democratic intellectual tradition, Stansel's history of feminism argues for why historical analysis is so important. Feminists, as well as those who argue for democracy, often forget those who have come before. And in that way, Stansel's work could not have been written without the vast body of women's history that has been produced since the 1970s, and more broadly, a turn towards what historians call social history, which seeks to tell the stories of those who have previous history of the book. Both are scholarly movements in which Stansel herself has taken part. And just as women's history has unlocked untold stories of women's social and economic lives, the feminist promise argues that feminism can unlock doors into political lives, the ways in which women's citizenship has structured and been structured by ideas and pressures that have been overlooked. It is a political and intellectual history that examines how the ideas of democracy hit the ground in the way reproductive, reproductive issues affect women's bodies, in the structures of dependency in marriage and family law, in the slippages between gender, race, and class, marginalizing 
groundbreaking work. And I welcome your own comments and responses at the end. But now I'd like to spend some time thinking about one of Stancil's key interventions in the historical literature, that is, how her work inter interacts with the work of other historians. Stancil's book is that rare breed, the broad synthesis that appeals to readers outside the academy and simultaneously pushes the work of historians further. I'd like to show one way Stancil's work does this by using my work as a case in point. And also, in talking about my work, I'd like to take up the theme of this lecture, rethinking the role of women and gender in history. It is my position that keeping the feminist promise involves rethinking the role of women and gender in history by resurrecting or drawing attention to the relationship between feminism and democracy, or women. Stanzel argues that feminism and democracy are linked and in many ways are part of the same intellectual tradi tradition. So let's probe the limits of that connection. If feminism is democracy's younger sister, then this means at least sometimes two things. First, that there is a reciprocal relationship between democracy and feminism, that they are inextricably intertwined. And second, that looking at women can help us understand things not just about feminism, but about democracy as a whole, its limits and accomplishments. This is, of course, what proponents of women's rights have said all along, that the world is a better place when all people have equal protection under the law, and that a democracy that excludes women is no democracy at all. And so I'd like to dwell for a little while on this idea that looking at feminism can help us understand things not just about women, but about democracy as a whole. In the case of the American military wives I study, this is a particularly interesting assertion. And so here I'd like to take a step back and talk about the ideas of the feminist promise in the context that I know best, U.S. domestic and international politics after 1945. At the end of World War II, the U.S. faced the task of reconversion, transforming a society and an economy geared toward war into one that would keep the peace. The main grace in the wheel of this transition were tropes of domesticity that had roots in World War II, where men were told they were fighting for mom and apple pie. Magazines were filled with advertisements for houses for GIs and future wives. And women were encouraged to stay strong so that men could come home to domestic tranquility. So, you see here, these are two paintings by Norman Rockwell. Probably you're familiar with at least the one on the right and probably also the one on the left. Both of these were used as posters during World War II to sell war bonds. Literally, they were, they were used to help fund the war. And the one on the right, I know, and I'm and the one on the left maybe as well, uh, appeared in the Saturday Evening Post. So these are images that are in circulation. These are, these are, these are ideas that you want to And of course, part of this is in line with what the feminist promise has to say about democratic homemaking in the 1950s. This is the idea that the United States has moved beyond women's rights, that the US was the freest, most prosperous society on the planet, and therefore had no need for striking campaigning. That was what communist I feel wants did. And if you had doubts, well, wasn't it more important to keep the communists out to be grateful for the peace that the sacrifice of war was over? Protecting democracy meant putting feminism aside. But feminism is democracy's younger sister, and the post-war moment, with fascism defeated, was democracy's moment to shine, or seemed to be. So, if feminism retreated to hearth and home, so must democracy in some way. My work deals, in part, with this relationship between feminism, democracy, and the home by looking at the lives of American military families in Germany. And I'd like to spend the next little while talking about what looking at American military families in Germany can tell us about the relationship between feminism, democracy, and the home. I'll briefly examine the way standard of living comparisons between German homes and American military family homes helps to construct a version of democracy that claims to move past ideology to create an idea of American democratic family and home life. And the second point is related. The ways the relationships between military wives and their primarily German domestic servants points to how the lives of women are integral to understanding, particularly to understanding the inherent tensions within democracy and how democracy is envisioned in practice. So first, let me paint a picture for you of what conditions were like under the military occupation of Germany. There was massive deconstruction and widespread shortages. Most of Germany had belonged uh, to within an inch of the There was little housing, little food, little fuel. The Allies, 
France, Britain, the US, and the Soviet Union had divided Germany and Berlin into four zones. Both of these maps were produced by the US military. The one on the left is actually uh, was in a guide for families who would go to join the troops who were occupying Germany. The one on the right is produced later, and if you notice, it's actually just the US zone. Um, it's just the U.S. zone, although there's Bremerhaven and Berlin, right? So there's all this stuff up there. Uh, but I wanted to show this really because I know we talked about the certain cities. Here's Munich. This is Nuremberg, right above the sea. Frankfurt is over here. And Wiesbaden, I talk about Wiesbaden a bit, is, is, is actually right here in the border with the French zone. So just, so when I say those things later, you know where they are. All of, the, all of these occupiers uh, sought to keep Germany from rising again to a military menace. In the U.S. zone, the strategy had four prompts, known as the four Ds. Democratization, denazification, decartalization, and demilitarization. We're concerned primarily with democratization here. And in the meantime, they were engaged in the imposition of military government and the establishment of structures of military occupation. Into this mix were brought military dependents, the wives and soldiers of, uh, the wives and families of soldiers. Uh, here's a picture from the Saturday Evening Post. Um, the woman is actually Leah Barry, and that's her daughter. The rationale for bringing the families was to boost morale. Troops were eager to slough off the hardships of wartime service, and families were thought to alleviate the hardship of occupation duty. It was also hoped that the presence of military families, especially wives and mothers, would blunt the perception of American soldiers as sexually aggressive toward German women and lower the skyrocketing BD, what we call S duty or SDI rate. But they came to have another purpose as well. That is, as representatives of American democratic family and home life to the surrounding Germans. And one key way they were representatives was in the goods that they consumed. In all the upheaval, household consumption occupied a special place. During the occupation, consuming Americans shared space, both literally and metaphorically, with the Germans. To say housing was in short supply is an understatement. It was virtually non-existent. So while many Americans, while Americans were initially barred from any fraternization with the Germans, that is, any interaction with them at all, this ban quickly broke down, in, in part because it could not be enforced given the devastating surroundings. Many Americans lived in requisitioned houses, homes that had been taken from their German owners for use by the occupation forces. Uh, for example, the Kale family, who lived in Germany from 1947 to 1949, lived in a house that had belonged to the owner of a department store while well, the former owner and his wife moved out of the house and into the caretaker's house at the bottom of the hill. So while uh, American enclaves were the initial intention, many American families, like the Kale, lived literally amongst the Germans, and those who did not were never far away from their neighbors. And this close proximity brought home one basic fact. The Americans had an embarrassment of riches, especially when compared to the piteously destitute Germans. And there was one level on which this comparison became unavoidable after the arrival of military families, consumption of household goods. The Washington Post reported in 1946 that to German women, these American women, the dependent wives, seem sleek and pampered. Their children are rose-cheeked and well-nourished. They emphasize unconsciously, in a way no man commonly could, the difference between the German's life and that of their rulers. Marie Wan, who became a dependent when her husband was plucked from his civilian life to help the occupation authorities rebuild the German school system, remembered that it was virtually impossible for an American to understand the harassing emotions that could beset one who ate a chocolate bar with dozens of eyes hungrily fastened on the disappearing confection, or the guilty despair one felt on emerging from the commissary, the military grocery store, in full view of the eternal hangers-on with a bulging bag of groceries. And actually, this is the commissary that she would have gone to. And you can see that it's on a public street, so literally just, you would walk out and there were all these Germans. While well, Germans in the cities travel to the country on weekends, hoping to trade a few tobacco shreds for a turnip, or pick a barely formed green apple, Marie Wan was more than aware that she and her fellow Americans lived in relative affluence. The commissary at an Air Force base outside of Munich was stocked, even in 1946, so right after the war, with fresh bread from the army baker, and fresh meat, eggs, and butter were kept available for dependents in the cold storage of the mess, where the soldiers eat, across the street. The goods were not unlimited, but not as strictly rationed as the Germans had thought. Germans weren't necessarily in the commissaries, but they certainly saw what came out of them. And how could they keep from identifying this great plenty as uniquely American? In other words, democratic home life moved democracy 
Oh well. Uh, move democracy out of the realm of public politics and into the private domestic realm of the home of home life. Uh, rather than a set of ideas, it was politic. Uh, it was a way of life. By rooting the idea of the American way of life in the home consumption of goods, post-war Americans created a vision of the world of ever-expanding possibilities. The myth that somehow, through equal consumption and unlimited production, Americans could live in a classless society where homey values thrived, children were smilingly well, smiling well-fed and well-educated, and political freedoms emanated as naturally from the system as the consumer products flowed from the factories. And this was an idea, I say, that was in part created and certainly reproduced on military bases in Germany. It was an ideology, of course, but its proponents claimed that it was more than one, that it had moved beyond ideology. So democracy was a way of life and not an intellectual tradition, or at least not an expansive intellectual tradition. Moreover, democracy, they claimed, was a way of life that could be embodied particularly well in the family. And here's where historical knowledge is really useful. We can look at this, and we can say that democracy in the 1950s and at other times was an ideology that is expressed particularly well in ideas of home and family. Looking backward, in the 19th century, something similar occurred with the valoration of Republican motherhood. And looking forward, there was an unexpected parallel to the women's movements in the 1970s. That is, making the home the center of democratic life made the personal political albeit in perhaps the opposite way that feminists in the 1970s were not to meet it. So this is my first point about families in Germany. Certain ways of household consumption came to be synonymous with democracy. This idea of democratic homemaking, or consumption, um, or what the military authorities called the democratic home and family life. For the US military in Germany, this was significant. Part of their mission was to democratize Germany to set up systems of government and civil society that would prevent a recurrence of fascism. So let's turn to the second point I want to make in my work, that looking at women is key to understanding how democracy is envisioned and practiced, but also how it is sold and advertised, as it were. And it's in the selling and the advertising of this idea or vision of democracy that we can also see some of the gaps or tensions within this vision. And I want to address this by looking at the relationship between the relationships between American women and their German domestic servants. I'm wondering if some slides are out of order, so hold on. Yeah, okay. So here's a vision of American home life, right? This is, and this is actually from a guide for, for families as they were coming over. This is what they said. This is what you will want to have. Okay, um, so let me start with a general description of domestic servants and the relations between domestic servants and the women who employ them. Domestic servants are a bit of a paradox in the examination of household life. They participate in household labor, but they are not, in any legal sense, part of the family. And they also seem out of place in our understanding of egalitarian democracy. Indeed, for most American women joining life in the European theater, or the ET, as they called it, the presence of domestic servants, like the bombed out buildings, and material deprivation surrounding them, signaled to military wives joining their husbands that something was different on the ground in Germany. Each set of family quarters was assigned one household servant or housemaid paid for by the German economy, so actually by the German government. And groups of two to six houses shared fireman gardener, who did literally that. He would light fires and take care of the outside. Uh, additional servants would, could, could be hired, but had to be paid out of pocket. And during the earliest part of the occupation, officers' families were provided two maids uh, by the US Army, but this proved to be too expensive as this project. The women who performed this work were primarily Germans who had been hired by the army, although families had the option of hiring a maid directly and paying for the going rate. Outside of Munich, one military wife described the women hired as generally Bavarian farm girls, so not really maids. And in other cities, they were also primarily local women, although they were sometimes drawn from the ranks of displaced persons. So displaced persons made up this, uh, this substantial support, uh, proportion of Germany's post-war population. They were mostly people who had been, they had been people who had been removed, removed from their homes during the war. A lot of them had been in Nazi forced work camps, although some of them were Holocaust survivors, although it's unclear how many Holocaust survivors were at this maze, probably how many. Employment with the Americans was a desirable position because it came with an increased ration card and one hot meal a day. This is a big deal if there's no food, right? And additionally, 
work as a domestic servant usually came with increased access to other goods in American homes, that is, excess in women across all clothes. So, unsurprisingly, interactions between American women and the German women who had been hired to cook and clean for them ran the gamut. Thefts were fairly common. Sometimes they were not. Mary Jane McNulty, who was an army wife, remembered arriving outside of Nuremberg in 1948 with two children in tow, only to discover that the assigned maid, and here are her words, had taken everything that my husband had bought, all the food and everything, and just left. Nobody ever heard of her again. But often, thefts were limited to food, soap, cigarette, and candy, items that would meet basic needs, or which had high black market value. But the primary barrier between American women was, was language. Soon after the arrival of the of dependents, the US military began offering classes in what it called commodity German to help women interact with their household help and store clerks, in the case that these were the main Germans that women would be talking to. Uh, this kitchen German, as it was more commonly called, uh, peppers the tales of army wives who lived in Germany during the occupation, adding humor or highlighting frustration, but always marking out the story as one that happened overseas. And this is actually, again, from the, the, the guidebook for occupation families. So you can, again, see what they're sort of imagining their lives would be like. Uh, Marie Wan, remember, she's the one who felt the guilty, guilty about eating in a chocolate bar. She remembered kitchen German as a horrible garble, but effective. For example, when a friend's maid inquired where to hang the laundry, the friend answered, there's a threat in the basement. Still, sometimes there were specks of commonality that crept through the language barrier and leapt across the chasm between victorious and conquered. A woman who lived outside of Frankfurt in 1946 commissioned a carpenter to make a dollhouse for her daughter. And when she asked the German, her German cook, who had also negotiated the building of the dollhouse, how to pay him, she was told to bring food. So in her words, she went to the commissary, against regulation, and bought two commissary sacks of staples, sugar, flour, soap, all these things. She took them to the carpenter's house, and saw his wife sitting on the curb, with tears streaming down her face with three little children. She said, so, we couldn't buy it. But however much these specks of shared motherhood countered the main tenor of the occupation, which was mostly soldiers' uh, relationship with German women, which is what mostly they were concerned about. One essential difference between Americans and Germans remains. Most of these anecdotes related so far revolve around one central thing, stark differences in standards of living. For German domestics, this was a difference they confronted every day they went to work. In the context of the mission of the American military families, to provide examples of democratic American family and home life, the presence of domestic servants is more prevalent still. Indeed, the presence of domestic help provided free of charge to all soldiers and their families was reported in the American press during the occupation, coming quite near to calling the military undemocratic. Employed by the US government to tend to American families, it seems these women were being paid in part to observe American democratic family and home life in action. Yeah, there. Um, the ways American families interacted, what they ate, how they lived, etc. And what they saw in the context of their own lives showed more the privilege of an occupying army and not the freedoms of democracy. If this was the democratic way of life, its egalitarian rhetoric belied its hierarchical reality. So let's look a little bit more at why it's so interesting to examine democracy through this lens of German-American servant employer. For many of the women joining their husbands, the maids in Germany were unexpected <coughs> and first welcomed. Vera Hopkins, who she was an, an Air Force wife who arrived outside of Munich in 1946, admitted that American women not used to domestic health were often overjoyed, that's her words, at the promise of an assigned maid. But on arrival, the maid seemed left like a luxury and more like requirements to maintain a certain standard of living. The German houses, nearly all requisitioned from Germans for American family use, were less modern and less comfortable than American ones, she claimed, with concrete floors and coal burning stoves. And so the maids eliminated some of the drudgery of stove tending and floor scrubbing to, to the relief of many in American housewives. Indeed, Hopkins affirmed, the Americans have found that keeping house in five rooms in Germany it's not the simple task for any able-bodied woman that it is considered in the United States. Most of them feel that if a maid does no more than scrub the floor, bring coal and wood, and fire the stove, she is decidedly worth having. So here I actually, Vera Hopkins was married to a historical officer 
for the big pictures on it. She actually wrote the history of setting up this community. So I, these are the pictures actually that she submitted. So here are some of the German houses on the outside. And here's some of the images. I apologize, some of the photographs are not included here because um, I took them in my um, But here's the living room, as you can see. Uh, here, you can see this is one of the coal stoves that she's talking about that looks so foreign. So you can see it's, it's a pretty good shape otherwise. But here's what she's really talking about. This, this thing right here only has cold water. Um, here's a stove that's part electric, part coal. And here's all they had in the kitchen. And there's several interesting things to say about this evidence that she has. First of all, in 1946, not all the U.S. was as modernized as Hopkins seems to say. Cold water taps, cold stoves, lack of indoor plumbing. They had indoor plumbing, right? But, but all these things were not things that all American homes would have. So already, in, in claiming something as American, she's articulating a kind of home life that would only be normal for a certain kind of person. That's middle class, that's probably white. Secondly, we have to remember that not all locations would have been this remote. So while these photos are bleak, they may or may not be characteristic of all of Germany. She's the one who also, or they, they live basically in Bavaria and Portland. And thirdly, modern, only a few decades before, would have been defined as German. German design and architecture and furniture and home goods would have been seen as the modern of the modern. So this glyph marking of Germans as backwards and Americans as progressive based on what's in the houses uh, it leaves out a lot. And it's also connected to what we have previous, what we've talked about previously with standards of living. The Americans have food and household goods, the Germans don't. So there's a slippage between home goods and home life. That so what's going on here? It leads back to our discussions of democracy. The first subtext going on here is that the Germans are backwards and mostly fascist, and that the Americans are progressive and democratic. Democracy is explicitly linked with progress, and this link is especially apparent in the context of post-war Germany, where the U.S. military is trying to democratize the Germans. They are literally trying to bring them out of fascism and into democracy. And although the military families are not the only agents of this, they are interesting places to look. Those who had the most intimate glimpses of American family life, the domestic servants, also had the clearest examples of how it didn't live up to what it promised. Democracy wasn't quite as egalitarian as and this second theme, of course, should be familiar by now. In laying out what Americans needed for home life, the military families in Germany and the U.S. military authorities were pretty explicitly linking democracy and family life. And most particularly, a family life designed by the presence of certain goods. This is most clearly demonstrated in a newspaper story that ran in the Berlin Grouper in 1946. There. It was run in anticipation of the first arrival of military families, and it included a photo spread for a soldier and a whack, or a woman in the Women's Army Corps. So they're both, they're both, they would both be considered part of the U.S. Army, so they're just like this play acting here. They posed in typical scenes of family life. On the left, you can see a breakfast table that's tricked out with tablecloths, china, curtains, comfy chairs, and on the right, there's a table and hard wooden chairs. I don't know if you guys can read either of those. So while military families were expected to cope in the short term with these hard tables and the, or hard chairs and the, and the un, unlaid out tables, um, eventually they would have the promise of this whole democratic life. So the, the democratic home and family life that the American military envisioned and imagined, the image on the left, and presumably hoped to model for the Germans, was one that centered on certain goods and consumption habits. So to sum up this section, we, we looked at how democracy, democracy retreating into the home made it seem like democracy had moved past ideology, um, that the discussion of women's rights is obsolete. And that this perception was made possible by constructing a vision of life that was rooted in the family. And then we talked a little bit about domestic servants, showing how this construction of democracy was important, not just because of what it was doing at home, but how it was being sold to Germans or represented to Germans. And we recognize that in this process of showing it, it revealed a lot of its own inconsistencies, both the underlying assumption that democracy is necessarily progressive or forward-thinking, and the fact that the way it was practiced was quite hierarchical. And there are other themes from the feminist progress that we can trace through these stories. The vestiges of family government certainly are present, in, in that maids work for wives who work for their husbands and children. And there's also the trope of crime. 
When democracy is linked to progress, there's a tendency to only think about how the present has improved the past, not to remember the problems the past may have also bequeathed. Um, but I'd like to relate these stories about consumption and domestic servants to today's theme that I promised I would talk about, the relationship between democracy and women, and how keeping the feminist promise may mean rethinking that relationship. The first step in rethinking the relationship between women and democracy is often finding women in unexpected places. The stories I've just told here, particularly about domestic servants, highlight some of the erasure of women and women's activities, both German and American, in the history of the end of World War II and the occupation of Germany. The American women in these stories are not war brides. Most are American army wives, crossing the Atlantic in the opposite direction. And the German women here are not squirrelines, whose supposed sexual exploits so worried military authorities. Rather, the German women are hard-working women, probably with children at home. And while the German women here certainly suffered, they weren't also the highly dramatized Trümmerfeld, the women of the rubble who formed brigades to clear the rubble of bombed-out buildings. So while there was some space for American families, they needed to be needed as democratic examples, there was no role for German domestic servants in the story that either Americans or Germans found useful to tell themselves about, about uh, to tell themselves about themselves after the war. And so this integral part of German and American women's experiences has been largely lost in history. But rethinking the relationship between women and democracy is more than just finding women in unusual places. It's also discovering that women and gender play a much bigger role in history than their often circumscribed social and political roles might imply. In the stories I just told, and in many of the stories told in the feminist comments, Women were keeping to their assigned role, and yet were integral to the way democracy was envisioned in practice. If feminism is the relationship between women and democracy, democracy's younger sister, then their story too is part of the story of feminism. To understand feminism and to understand democracy means taking seriously the history of both. So, way back at the beginning, I started by summarizing the key points of the feminist promise, and I probed some of them further just now by putting them in the context of my work and arguing that rethinking women and gender means putting them in historical context. So now I'd like to end with, by <coughs> recapping the story of Dean Stout and how, thinking, how rethinking women in history may have an impact on us today. By all accounts, Dean Jennifer Stout was a beloved member of the Elmhurst administration, appointed Dean of Women in 1931 and Dean of Students in 1948. She retired in 1961. She was part of the transition of Elmhurst from an institution devoted primarily to preparing students to enter the ministry to one to prepare students for many professions by following the liberal arts curriculum or many of the other ones. She worked tirelessly, tirelessly to improve the lives of students under her care, providing counsel and preparing students to meet their educational experience, expectations. And it was her, in her honor, of course, that this annual lecture is named. And so now at the end of this talk, this summary of Dean Stout's contributions to Elmar should bring to mind a few things. First, that women appear even when you don't expect them. Dean Stout was dean of students, all students, not just women, or dean of students and dean of women, at a time when women were often presumed incapable of leadership and kept in supporting roles. And it is true that Dean Stout was not the president and that education fit with longer traditions of women's work. But still, she was in a position of power and pushed for help for students who needed it, sometimes overriding others in the administration. And the second thing to be clear is that part of feminist work has often been to work patiently and tirelessly to improve the life of women, believing that doing so would benefit everyone. And Dean Stout is certainly part of this venerated tradition. So when women's history as we know it first picked up steam many years ago, Joan Scott, an eminent historian, theorized that gender is the field of history. It can't be separated from history. It is a thing that history is made of. The feminist promise by drawing together the contributions of nearly a generation of women's historians, proves Scott right and pushes us forward. Women's rights are at the heart of democracy, even when they appear to be sidelined. Feminism is an inextricable part of democracy as an intellectual tradition, enfolding both its high ideals and its chronic failures. The feminist promise demands that we square ourselves with democracy and all its dirty little secrets. Indeed, one could even say that feminism is even more promising when it is more than an ideal, when it is a conviction, an argument. In her conclusion, Christine Stanzo writes that her book is, for the 21st century, 
that it may transport the riches and assurances of the past, along with its sobering lessons, to the women and men who now take up the task of making good on feminism's democratic promise. I take that to mean that to keep the feminist promise, we must constantly seek to understand how women and women's rights have ever been at the heart of the way we think about democracy. We must claim feminism as part of democracy's patient work. Raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, thank you. Your comments on Germany as a kind of ethnic German brought back a lot of memories for me. Uh, but I have two questions, uh, well, interrelated, but to you just a second. Uh, talk about democracy, and I'm very concerned about what's happening to democracy because it seems our votes are forgotten about as soon as the lobbyists take over. And you mentioned Afghanistan briefly. Uh, sometimes I'm thinking we're kind of becoming Af Afghanized ourselves here. Every man has, because of the NRA, there's a lobby, obviously, every person seems to have a right now to uh, AK-47, the violence in this country is something like I, I never knew growing up. It makes me sick, frankly. And uh, the second, the more recent trend, which would be more pertinent to your talk, uh, that I regard in my mind as a tal Talibanization of women, I, my uh, fundamentalist Christian groups. And uh, I'm an old, old line Republican, but I, I, I uh, I'm not in sync with this, with these people coming out of the far right now. And I'm all line conservative. I don't see anything conservative about what I've seen. I see, see things are reactionary. So I'm very disturbed about my country in terms of we sit here like cows, but the lobbyists decide what to do. The country's being weaponized in the semi precedent what we do about all this. No, I, we'll let you answer that one before okay. we go on to another. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, that's not a question that I can answer, right? What do we do about democracy? I, I'm not the one who can answer that. But, as democracy is your sister, I think yours is an opinion that is shared by many people. The, the, this, this feeling that democracy is, is a betraying feminism and everything that feminists has accomplished up to this point. And so my answer would be, my talk was aimed at people to get them involved in politics, whatever their spectrum is, right? So if if you feel that way, then do something about it. And that's, I mean, that's what I meant by at the end when I said we have to claim feminism as part of democracy. Then claim it. Uh, what made you uh, decide to make uh, military families your area of study? Sure. Um, so I actually came to graduate school at not intending to study gender, uh, to be a gender historian. I, I thought I would be a political historian, and I think I am still a political historian. Um, but I found the military families in Germany to, to unite a lot of things that I was interested in, which is how has it, American politics influenced the world? So we have Americans who are in Germany and haven't been studied. And also the way that democracy is more than just what happens at the poll. Um, that it's more than just an electoral system or a political a set of, of ideas, that it's also embodied and lived and practiced. And so the 1950s and, and, and American homes is a really interesting side of that. And I found so both the international aspect, the German-American aspect, and this, this home life. Um, and also I found along the way that the military is undergoing amazing transformation after, after World War II. It, uh, they reinstate the draft in 1948, and so there's, and there's this sudden, uh, there's this increase in the standing army, and then this sudden allowance uh, for these soldiers to have families, so that the military family doesn't really exist in the numbers that we know of it today until after World War II. Um, so that's, that's what I find interesting in how I know. Other questions? 
the, a little ironic that the, excuse me, the American military wives were complaining about no curtains and tablecloths, but the German side looks so much more contemporary and modern as, it, as, we, uh, as we use today. Mm -hmm. So um, it seemed like we were the ones that were old fashioned. Yeah, you mean you mean in the, in the differences in aesthetics yes. of how we look at things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And it, it's as I pointed out, it's interesting that they completely forgot that German had Germany had this amazing influence on the way we looked at design, right? had a little more cachet than liberalism in the U.S. at the moment, so if we want to, if we want to get people involved, calling a democracy center sister works better that way. Um, but I think it's because the, 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 the first person who's really articulating women's rights in the way that we identify as feminism is Mary Watson Craft, and she's, she's writing in the midst of what they were calling democracy, right, with these, uh, the French Revolution and also the American Revolution, but really the French Revolution, um, and, and these ideas of the rights of man. And she steps back and says, wait a second, the rights of man, what about the rights of women? Right? Uh, and so I think uh, that's, that's where you can get away with calling it democracy's younger sister. But you were also right in the fact that democracy and liberalism have been sort of, I mean, democracy isn't the same as it was at the beginning of the, eight, or the end of the 18th century. Right? It means something different now. And a part of that has been it's sort of folding up into how we think about liberalism. You're the, you're the political theorist, so you could probably <laughs> tell me more about that, how that happened. But, um, but now that we do have to sort of grapple with it as liberalism, maybe not younger sister, maybe maybe twin sister, right? Maybe something like that. Emily, your discussion never considered the fact that um, it seems like feminism basically uh, is basically just women being equal to men in terms of equal opportunity, right? I mean, Gloria Stein, of all people, realized that there's more reality than just political rights and social equality. Uh, she herself has realized that there are things which women can do that men cannot do. Men are more grounded in physical reality. Men are, women are more grounded in intuitive reality, spiritual reality. To me, the prototype of history would be Joan of Arc. When you see what Joan of Arc did, just a young girl here. She had these visions, these voices telling her to leave France. And, that took, and Joan of Arc was more than just some wacky figure from history. She is the realization of what women should be. Our society has gotten so competitive, we're killing ourselves through competition. Women are more into cooperation, into a, spirit, a spiritual intuition that can make our society more beautiful. Instead of women competing with men, they should show a different way of looking at reality, a, real, a spiritual reality that we desperately need right now. And because Gloria Stein wrote a book about this, <coughs> didn't get much attention, unfortunately. Now, now, what do you think of this? Because your whole discussion was all about, you know, women being equal with men in the in the physical plane. Well, there's a spiritual plane out there, and I believe we have to realize this is where the greatest strengths of women lie, as we're moving into the Aquarian age and this new age, which the Mayan calendar talks about, mm -hmm. which people laugh at, but it's real. It really is. Well, I think you, you said you said there that uh, women think that uh, something about creating a new reality, right? Bringing something on a new reality, and I think that that is what feminism says, but it, it but it doesn't but it doesn't come to it in terms of women are, are different than men or that women are have bring something different to men. It says yes, if we if we take feminism seriously, we will change. We will change uh, the way reality looks. It it's not. Um, the argument that you're making about the, or that you seem to be behind, that women are somehow different and better than men, and therefore can check the sort of crazy unbalances that men bring to 
this is a very old argument, um, but one that I think, the one that I think ultimately impoverishes, impoverishes women, I mean, not, not in the financial sense, in the sort of like intellectual sense, uh, because to say that, to say that women are somehow different than men and therefore have different uh, things, all women have something different than all men, uh, it, it, it takes away, it takes away the, it, even so, even so, even the generalization takes takes away the particularities of each woman's experience, um, and also, oh, sorry, I've, I've, um, I lost my train of thought again. It doesn't. What it does is it forces women into making into making claims that say they are women and yet not, and I think we should just. We don't need, it, it forces women into being competitive towards men, into saying, and it, it, it feeds the fire of people who say feminists are anti-men, feminist, feminism has no room for men, feminism is only about women and women's rights, and I don't think that's what feminism is trying to do. It's trying to create a better reality where men and women cooperate together, but I don't think they have to make those claims based on the fact that women naturally are better at cooperating than men. I think, I think there are much better ways to make that claim. Um, my question is regarding feminism today, especially during a time of international feminist movements. Um, I just wanted to know that in an age of globalization, is feminism still connected to democracy, or is it more about um, economics and cultural change, especially in our globalized society? I think that, thank you, that's an excellent question. Um, democracy was born, right, or, or feminism was born as democracy's younger sister. And you have to remember that a lot of these spreadings of feminism came when people were trying to spread democracy, right? Um, this is not to say that women in undemocratic societies have no idea about women's rights. Obviously they do, right? But, but the way that feminism as we know it is, 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 is articulated, that's what I'm saying, um, is in the context of these, of these democratic ways of thinking. Um, and so your question was, is, is this global feminism that's now existing, is it more cultural and is it economic? Political. And my and my answer would be that that the, the line between them is very blurry, right? And then maybe those categories aren't incredibly helpful. We can talk about politics, um, but it, the, it, politics is a way of talking about power, right? And if power lies in economic inequalities, then it's political to talk about them, right? If power lies in cultural inequalities, then it's political to talk about them. And so I think feminism is still democratic, and if it looks differently than it did before, that doesn't mean that's what happened. I mean, that's that's sort of um, you can still pull the thread through. Yeah. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I'm very concerned that women don't seem to have a lot of choice, and I look at that as I look at my parents' generation after World War II. Um, and all the men came back and all the women who had gone out to work in the factories were then told they should stay home because the men needed the jobs. And so they did. And I grew up in um, a situation where it was one earner families. The father, the husband went out to work. The woman stayed home, took care of the family. And if the woman wanted to work in those years, she was seen as something unusual and um, it was difficult for women to make that choice and to have it honored. And then, in, I'd say, the, in my experience in the 70s, I had all these friends who were starting to raise families, and they would like to have worked less and spent some time home with their children, but because of the economics situation, they couldn't. You could no longer afford, in general, unless you were very wealthy, to have a one-earner family. You had to have two people out in the workforce earning money in order to support a home, an automobile, and then you had two automobiles. And so I had an enormous number of friends who would have liked to have not worked at all outside of the home or worked much less, but again, they did not have that choice because economics forced them to be out in the workforce. And it still is regarded as 
the home is the woman's purview. So we have a whole group of women who go out and work full time every day and come home and then have to have another full time job. And sometimes the husband will help them out. Or sometimes there is no husband in the home or partner. And it's just it just seems to me that um, one of the things feminism should be fighting for is women's right to choose. And of course, we've seen where that's gotten us in this political election. I was at a lecture last night by um, a, a professor from North Park University who's from Africa, from Kenya. And she was talking about the role of women in Africa. And present at this lecture were both the president of Illinois now and DuPage now. And afterwards, we were talking and saying, we thought we'd won these battles in terms of reproductive rights, and now we're having to go back in and, and dig the trenches. So what do you see as the progress that is being made? And I know your purview is mainly US history, but in, in terms of the global, there seems to be a lot of progress in other countries. And I see the US as sort of backsliding. Um, I want to address what you talked about first uh, with the, with the women, women's work, women working and the sort of constraints on their economic choices that they're making. Um, and I think, uh, and this also is related to the second part of your question about feminism globally. I think people want to put feminism into one particular box and say this is feminist and this is not. And I think in some ways that's helpful. We need, we need to know what's feminist and what's not. But, but, the, but what I've been trying to talk about today is how feminism is, is an argument, right? It's a point of view. So it can be equally applicable not in the US and in the US. And I think what, where feminism is helpful in trying to address, okay, what's happening to women's lives that they couldn't work and now they could work, in fact, they have to work when they might not want to, it seems, like it's a, it seems like it's a problem of choice and we could talk about it that way. But we could also talk about it as, as, a, as a way of women's work being not valuable, right? And that's work within the home and without of the home, right, outside of the home. Um, in fact, the idea that, that work happens outside of the home and then what happens in the home is something different is actually something fairly new. Right? The idea that you, you supported yourself by earning a wage outside of the home. This is something that's only a couple of centuries old. Right? And so this, this wage earner system that we have that seems so natural um, is something that's actually quite new. The fact that women are, are, are earning money that's supporting the home, this is actually some, this is of course something that's really old. Right? The word economy actually comes from, I think it's Greek, um, that means what's happening in the home. Right? It's actually talking about the home economy. So we see this women working as this new thing. It's not actually. Women have always worked to support their families. What and then so that's constant. And the other thing that's constant is that their work is not being valued, either in the home or even outside of the home. Right? If they're working their jobs, they're routinely paid less. They get the less desirable jobs, things like that. So if that's if feminism needs to address that, that's where feminism can come in. And it was the, this answer to this other question. When there's economic and social inequalities, it's political to talk about them, and that's what makes feminism present. Um, and as to feminism globally, I know much less about that. But um, I think we have to be—we have to understand that there's gains and that there's gains and losses. That some that we can move forward in some ways, um, but we can't move forward all at once as much as we wish we could sort of move our noses and make make the problems go away. That it's incumbent on us to be a part of democracy to do that work. We've gone a little bit over time, but if I could have your attention for just a moment before we thank our speaker. My name is Russell Ford. I'm the Director of Intercultural Education here at Elmhurst College, and I just wanted to thank all of you for attending the Stout Lecture today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, this is the last of our intercultural events for the year, the last of the four. Um, I did want to let you know that we will be putting together our program for next year. Uh, so please watch for that, and I hope I'll see many of you here next year. As you know, uh, we work very hard here at the college to bring you a really exciting and diverse array of speakers. Uh, in the back of the room, we have students. I believe they have buckets. I've been told to say that they have buckets. But these students are there. If you'd like to give to the college to help us keep this vibrant speaker series going, we would very much appreciate your donation. And now if you'd join me in thanking today's speaker, Emily Swafford.